Thank you for joining us. We'll get started shortly. Thank you all for coming. People are still coming into the room. So we're just going to wait a few moments. I also want to uh, thank all of our LinkedIn people who are watching us as well. Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome to Gray Associates Higher Education Demand Trends webinar. I would like to welcome Jerry Silberman, Senior Vice President of Administration and Finance at Elizabethtown, who will be joining our very own Bob Atkins, our Gray CEO, Program Evaluation Expert, and best-selling higher education author. There are a few housekeeping items to get started with. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a place labeled Q&A. Please feel free to add your questions there. We'll get to as many as we can during this session and we can follow up later with you if we do run out of time for some of our questions. Have you been wondering about launching a particular new program or what the potential job market looks like for your students? At the end of the presentation, we will give you the opportunity to review programs in real time with PES and Gray's Director of Customer Success. You can pop your program requests into the Q&A at any time during the presentation. Finally, I wanted to let you know that you will receive a link to the webinar recording and presentation slides, so please look for it in your email. And without further ado, I will turn things over to Bob. Thank you very much, Marianne, and welcome everyone to our webinar. And uh, thank you much, very much, Jerry, for joining us today. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about demand trends for higher education today. And we'll share with you uh, both the employer side of that and the student demand side. Um, uh, as I mentioned, as mentioned, Jerry, why don't you introduce yourself um, and your role at, at Elizabethtown? Sure. Yeah, I uh, joined Elizabethtown here in the fall of uh, 2019. I serve as the Senior Vice President of Administration and Finance uh, since then. Uh, so that's that's after a career at Kutztown University, which is a regional state university, which I was there uh, nearly 30 years. So it's been quite a change here at Elizabethtown, but it put a great one. Thank you. So let's uh, take a look at what we're up. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about data that we use in program evaluation and uh, just a little bit about Gray before we get started. Uh, we are the proud parents of a program evaluation system. Uh, system is more than just data. We have a lot of data um, and we'll talk about some of that. But that data has to be put together in software to make it usable and uh, obvious how to interpret it. And then you need to wrap around that the right facilitated processes. So let me walk around this for just a second. We'll get into the data. First, you need to understand your markets uh, because if there's no market for your program, um, it, it's a little bit like a tree falling in a forest. Uh, you'll end up with few students and the students you have might not get jobs. So that understanding of student demand, um, employment opportunities, and competition is, is a vital part, and that all fits in markets. Then you need to understand the revenue cost and margin of your academic programs, not because every one of them needs to be profitable, that's really not the case, um, but you need enough ones that make money to subsidize the ones that are important to your mission that don't make money. Uh, of course, your programs need to meet your academic standards, whether that's internal standards for number of students who pass, or external standards, uh, that is tests, for example, in LSAT, or the, um, uh, the student licensure, uh, the nurse licensure test, um, you know, your folks that take those programs have to be able to pass the associated tests in order to be successful in their careers. Um, so uh, mission of the institution also important. Um, in fact, the central point here um, is to make sure that the programs you're offering, the margins they're generating are sufficient to sustain and enhance the mission of the institution. All this can't be done by a machine. 
Uh, you need the right people involved in the right process to make good program decisions. You need their judgment, their knowledge of your local market, and importantly, their knowledge of your institution. So designing a good process, getting folks into it, being very open and transparent about how things are being evaluated and who's involved, very important part of successful program evaluation. Now let's turn to the data itself. Um, we will get through one program in depth and some general statistics. Uh, if you would like to see the data on another program at the national level, please go ahead and enter it in the Q&A or the chat. Either one will be monitoring, and we'll see if we can't get to that at the end of our presentation. Let's focus in on student demand. And while we're doing that, let me just make a point up front. Oftentimes, people focus almost exclusively on employer demand for academic programs and are making decisions. That's an error. Uh, if students aren't interested in the program, it's very difficult to fill the seats. So you really need to know both. It's not that employment's not important, it is, but student demand is also an essential part of program evaluation. Now we think about student demand, they're indicators that really tell us about different points in time. So Google, as this entertaining character uh, illustrates, is forward looking. I've never quite understood exactly what this icon is. I think that's a selfie stick he's holding but conceptually looking forward. And the Google data does that because it shows us what people are searching for now. We're planning to go to school three, six, 12 months from now. So it gives us a snapshot. It's not a five year future, but it's a few months out from where we are today. We look at enrollment, that's pretty much current. Uh, it's updated three times a year. Uh, we currently have spring enrollment data, which we'll share today. Uh, so it's, it's pretty, consistent with what you're going through at the moment. And it shows us very clearly what students want um, right now. What's been this primary source in many program analytics for a long time is iPads, the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System. Unfortunately, that's really backwards looking, not forwards looking. The most current data is from 2021. And for a four-year academic program, iPads is gonna be showing you what students were interested in when they picked their major. So that's going to be three to five years before they graduate. So we're really looking at data, uh, if it's 2021 completions, from three to five years before that, or earliest possible, 2018. That's now five years ago. That's really old data in terms of what students are looking for. It's good information if you want to know approximately what the total size of a program is, um, but very weak information if you want to know what the trends are. For trends, uh, you look at enrollment and Google. All three are helpful. And, and of course, we keep all three. We won't share iPads with you today just because it only updates once a year. So it's not very informative on a monthly basis. We look at Google and what's going on. We report on three years worth of data. The light blue here is 2021. The darker blue is 2022. And that green color is 2023. Um, as you can see, it's up. Um, 3%. Now the rate of increase is slowing. Um, you can see it was up a little bit more last month in March um, and uh, more up even further year over year in January. So that rate of increase is slowing down, uh, but it's still positive and still a hopeful indicator for the future. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, um, that's not playing out actually right now in terms of enrollment. So uh, I hope it's an indicator of what's going to be happening coming up, but we haven't quite caught up to that on the enrollment side. We look at what people are interested in, uh, not surprisingly, given recent news, the fastest growth is for academic programs concerned with artificial intelligence, with 89% year-over-year growth in this category. So that is really, uh, I think, almost a record in programmatic search volume growth for a program of over, with over 10,000 searches in a month. Number two is a well-known uh, denizen of this particular list. Cybersecurity at 47% growth has been one of our top growers for some time. Keep in mind, it is now one of the largest programs in the US as well. So that's very rapid growth on top of a very large program. Uh, I will say, I don't think all that growth is coming, you know, sort of from new students. It's coming from people who probably would have majored in computer science um, if they had not been in cybersecurity. So we're not getting brand new students there but we are getting a lot of growth in that particular program. Same is probably true of artificial intelligence, although I think its appeal is broader than just coders. And frankly, um, a lot of the tools are fairly accessible to non-coders as well. So it'd be a shame if people who are less technical weren't interested there. 
uh, many, many of those tools are going to be developed in a way where uh, the average layman can use them. As all of you know, you've probably been out there on ChatGPT. You can get it to do some work for you with very much plain English commands. And I think that's going to be increasingly common across those platforms. Then we get to some, well, let's call it more traditional things, health and medical administration services. We have three other health programs, registered nursing still uh, growing. That's actually been in decline. So that's a really good sign to see registered nursing coming back. Uh, and mental health counseling up 24% and surge tech up 23%. And we have a handful of other programs, organizational leadership, creative writing, marketing management general, and acting. Now let's carve out a couple of things here to keep an eye on. Creative writing is one and acting. Uh, across a couple of these data sets, we're going to see rising interest in what I'm going to call creative programs uh, that uh, are, are associated with the creative arts, in particular, um, uh, yeah, acting related or cinematography kinds of things. Um, now, let's take a look at what's going on in enrollment. I mentioned that enrollment is not quite keeping up with Google. Um, that is very much the case at the master's level, down 8% year over year. Um, it had a nice little perk in growth between 2019 and 2020, um, then dropped off between 2021 and then dropped off even faster coming into last fall. This spring, unfortunately, very small base. So let me just point something out here. We got a half a million people on this fall enroll. Spring, only half that, but a very sharp decline, 15%. So very disappointing results at the master's level in terms of new enrollment. Now, I should also pause. Many of you have seen the overall enrollment numbers that just came out. I'm not reporting on that. This is new enrollment. Um, that will impact overall enrollment, but in a relatively small way because there are uh, years of students in other programs, uh, or excuse me, uh, many students in other years in the program besides a new enroll. So that uh, will decline more slowly, actually, uh, as this effect ripples through. Now, what's growing? Even in a 15% decline, there are master's programs that are growing, and the fastest one turns out to be audiology and speech language pathology. We've got two other healthcare programs on this list, phys ed and coaching and physician assistant up 2%. Uh, we've got a lot of data in tech, information technology up 8 18%, information science and studies up 13%, data analytics up 11, and business analytics up eight. So this whole analytics sector is red hot. You know, that's a total of 19% between the two programs. Um, and I suspect these two are competing for many of the same students. So. Uh, very interesting growth pattern there around data analytics. That's going to tie back to artificial intelligence as well. Bachelor's enrollment, a little bit better story last fall. It was up 1%. Unfortunately, that didn't continue in the spring. Again, keep an eye on the totals here. 1.4, 1.5 million students in the fall. Only 129,000 in the spring. So uh, this is a decline off a relatively small base but still not what we're looking for, uh, down almost 17% in spring 2023. Again, there's growth within this. And here, uh, let's start with creative. I was very interested to see this. In the green, we have three different creative programs making our top 10, digital communications and media multimedia. Uh, and, where is my other one? Uh, cinematography up 20% and art and art studies up 11%. So there seems to me to be a uh, increasing interest in uh, programs associated with, with creation, with creativity. Um, then we have data um, and, and technology. Um, aerospace up 34%, information sciences and studies up 16%. And here's our data analytics again, up 15%, business analytics up 11% at the bachelor's level. So uh, again, these two are very, very hot. Um, and then there's everything else. Communication general up 44%, anthropology 15, and animal sciences 14. So we've got some uh, pretty consistent trends here in some ways, uh, especially around business analytics across the different degree levels. Um, data remains hot. And then we have, I think, these creative fields that are cropping up pretty consistently across degree levels and across our different measures of student demand. So what's going on out there in the MOOCs, the massively online open uh, courses or curricula? 
Um, these are used to be a hot segment. Everybody talked about MOOCs and how it's going to destroy higher education. Uh, and, you know, it, it didn't. Um, and we sort of thought it went away, I think, in, in the you don't read about it much anymore. Like, oh, great. You know, the MOOCs didn't, didn't do what they, we thought they would do. They're actually still out there and they're doing a lot. Let me just take a look at one program here. In the month of April, 912,000 people signed up for Foundation's Data Data Everywhere. Now, please don't mistake that for the same thing as enrollment in a college course. Price point's much, much lower. Might even be free. I haven't checked. Um, and many of those people will never get past the first class. In fact, they might not even attend the first class. So it's not the same as college, but it's still an enormous number of people who are coming, getting on these platforms and learning in a new environment, perhaps getting a certificate. Um, so this is a very important competitor, very difficult to compete with because of their economies of scale. And um, for most colleges and universities, the cost of acquiring a student uh, would more than eat up the revenue from the student taking one course. So it's a, a difficult sector in which to compete, even if you had the online offerings to play in some of these fields. Uh, there are ways to do it, in particular, if you offer courses to employers and the employers in turn recruit the students for you. Uh, that gives you very low entry cost for a given course for the marketing side. Um, so that may be a way of playing in this course specific space. Um, or put your courses on the platform. I'm not sure what the rev share is there, but that often is used by schools as a way of actually recruiting students. And they'll allow them to take a couple of courses and then enroll in the program at the institution at whatever the regular price is for being in that program. Um, so that can be a way of using the MOOCs to your advantage. Now, we've got a couple of healthcare programs on here, um, the science of well-being and introduction to psychology. Um, data and tech, though, dominates what people are interested in in the MOOCs. It's like the medium um, dictates what the, the interest. Um, so data and technology, foundations of uh, data, uh, number one, foundations of user experience, number three, tech support fundamentals, still almost 400,000 students in that. Uh, crash course on Python, process data from dirty to clean. And finally, um, HTML, CSS, and Java for web developers with over 200,000 people who enrolled in that just in the month of April alone. And we have a couple of others, learning how to learn and uh, project initiation, starting a successful project, both with over 200,000 new enrolls. Bob, there is a question uh, based on a, a previous slide, please. What is your take on the communication percentage increase in enrollment? Could it perhaps be another creative field? You know, I was thinking that as I said it, I think that's possible. Um, it's also a variation on business potentially, since a lot of that's business communication. Um, so that's one, I think that's a possible answer. One of the challenges we have is why we often know what the data is. Uh, we, all, we don't really know why people have made that choice. So I can only hypothesize with others. Um, and I do think it's possible that's writing that, that little spike we're seeing an in interest in the creative fields. I, I think what's going on, if I were really going far out, I would say um, we're looking at people who are interested in becoming influencers on the web, and they want to accumulate the skills in college they'll need to be successful there. So anything you can do to position some of these fields around the web internet and uh, the whole influencer economy, I think, would make it appealing to students. I'm not sure it's the best possible career choice for them, um, but it certainly is something that's of great interest in the short term. And I think longer term, whether they become a personally become an influencer, learning the tools of that could be helpful to them in a business, uh, business career or specifically in marketing communications in the future. So speaking of jobs, let's take a look at what's going on out there. If we thought the drop in enrollment was concerning, uh, the drop in jobs is getting to be a real attention getter. Um, now, this isn't quite what it seems. Last year, particularly at the beginning of the year, we were still coming out of COVID and the level of job postings was extremely unusual and very high. So keep that in mind. We're anniversary very big numbers, artificially high coming out of um, the recession that was caused by COVID. But I start to look at these and they're, they're relatively no, lowish numbers. And now we've got month over month declines taking place. We're down 36% year over year. Now 500 change thousand job postings is still a healthy number. But I do worry that um, we are slowing down job growth. 
And if this continues, eventually we could create a recession. I don't see that right away. Those job numbers are not terrible, um, but they are a concern. Uh, what are people looking for? Uh, general operations managers leads a list. I don't remember seeing this um, in number one before um, with some 51,000 job postings. I suspect what's happened is they're trying to refill jobs that went empty uh, during COVID and that they're still playing catch up. Not easy to fill a general uh, manager job because you can't just hire one off the street. Um, obviously, they need experience. So, um, you know, you've, you've got to grow these people. And if you have a gap because you didn't have the folks in your pipeline developing because of COVID, now you're short um, as you bring people back into the workforce. Registered nurses, similar problem, except that a whole lot of people left nursing during the recession, excuse me, after, during um, COVID. And so now we're trying, and by the way, we had a shortage of nurses before COVID. I believe that shortage is only worse now. The number of patients is uh, approximately the same as it was before, but we lost a lot of nurses. So very high volume of nursing job postings out there. It, um, it's a substantial percentage of the uh, nursing population as a whole. Um, administrative assistance. I am always surprised when I see this. Um, I thought that we, you know, sort of tapered off on the presence of administrative assistance 20 years ago. Um, and it appears, however, that that was not the case. And still a lot of folks out there seeking admin assistance. Retail sales, not surprising, biggest uh, single occupation in the United States. Um, computer and user support specialists, social and human services assistants, elementary school teachers, all in our top 10. And then we have a string of other business-related uh, occupations, customer service representatives, HR specialists, and marketing managers. And I think you know, in the HR specialists, I think we're still, again, catching up on COVID. Um, a lot of hiring that's gone on, a lot of HR management that had to happen uh, between laying everybody off going into COVID and then trying to hire them all back afterwards. Uh, now let's take a look at certificates. I was interested to see that a uh, nurse practitioner actually leads this list with 5,000 job postings requesting certification in nurse practitioner. So uh, hadn't seen that before. Nursing's often been at the top, but not specifically nurse practitioner. Secret clearance, common entry in the very top. And you'll see that uh, the, the certifications are, are overweighted towards health. Um, that's because we like to check and make sure everybody that takes care of us in health is actually qualified to do it. So it's not surprising that there are more certifications occurring there also generally very big fields. Um, so there are lots of people that need to be certified. So you can see basic life cert, um, certification, cardiac life support, pediatric advanced life support, and board certified behavior anal analyst. Um, various other places, I mentioned security, um, certified public accountant, uh, professional engineer, top secret clearance. So even more secret than our secret clearance before. And finally, insurance licensure. Must be a lot of government jobs and defense contractors who are looking to hire folks. Now let's take a look at the program of the month. Um, this is going to come straight of our, out of our program evaluation system. And we're going to look at four factors, student demand, employment, competition, and degree fit. We think those are the four key elements when you're thinking about the market for an academic program. When we do this work, we rate and rank programs on about 50 variables. Um, and that leads to uh, an overall ranking. And then you'll notice that we've percentiled things. So this 96 is the percentile. Well, percentile of what is a reasonable question. We look at about 1500 programs. So the top program here is in the top 4% of those 1500 programs, where it's one of the top 60. So that's what the percentiles mean. You'll notice it's color coded. Uh, the dark green means it's 96 percentile or higher. As we go from dark green to red, um, things are getting going from great to not so great. Um, so green is good, red is bad. Why do we color code? Because it allows you to look at a page like this and very quickly discern where the hotspots are, what's, what's really going well, and where there are areas of concern. And the waste individual programs get to the top of the ranking um, varies a lot from program to program. So even on a relatively simple chart like this, there's quite a lot you can learn. Let's take a look at logistics, for example. Um, 96 percentile, so it's one of our highest scoring programs, does really well on student demand, does really well on employment, but third percentile in terms of competition, it's an extremely competitive program. Uh, lots of people have launched it. 
um, but still healthy as far as uh, attracting students and placing them. Uh, let's take a look at a very different program. And many of you, for example, may make your decisions uh, primarily based on employment. Every so often you can run into a real problem. So uh, this is an extreme case, but we've got very good employment score here at 87th percentile. Um, unfortunately, we have almost no student demand for packaging services. Not surprising, I bet 90% of us didn't know that was a thing you could do for a living. Um, but I, uh, actually one of the guys I went to the gym with used to work in that industry and it's a huge industry. And competitive intensity, almost no programs in that field. So it's at the 99th percentile. Here's another one that's similar, a Marine Science Merchant Marine Officer. Um, only 50th percentile on student demand, almost no competition besides the Merchant Marine Academy down in uh, Connecticut. And, um, and then we've got 91st percentile in terms of employment. So good field for jobs. So we really can't confound uh, the presence of jobs with the presence of students' interest. Sometimes they're the similar, but in many cases they're not. So you really need both. Now let's dive into one particular program, kinesiology and exercise science. You can see it's at the 99th percentile, uh, but lots of competition and a relatively low employment score. So let's go through and figure out what's going on. On the student demand side, all dark green. So this program, uh, almost all dark green, um, is at the 97th percentile or higher on five out of six of our student demand indicators. The sixth is Google search volume, which is at the 86th percentile. So still very healthy. Um, now there's a couple in international page views. There's a pretty interesting program for international students, 98th percentile. New student enrollment is very strong, 99th percentile. 22,000 students enrolled in this program last spring. On ground completions at in market institutions, some 26,000. Not much online here. We've only got 1,000 students enrolled online. That's not surprising in kinesiology, though I would say um, even a program like this potentially could be taught hybrid uh, with students uh, attending on ground for much of their, excuse me, online for much of their book learning and then coming in at some point in their uh, training to do the hands-on portion of it. But obviously not a, a program that's particularly well suited to an online environment. In terms of growth, it's um, good. Uh, you know, we've got 3% growth in Google search, 3% growth in student enrollment, and 6% growth in completion. So uh, several years ago, this was even more popular than it is now, and those students are now graduating, but still healthy numbers in terms of growth, especially for such a large program. Competition is where we begin to run into some troubles. Uh, excuse me, employment, where we begin to run into some troubles. Now, first point here is, uh, like many other programs, uh, only 12% of the folks who graduate with a degree in kinesiology end up working in fields related to kinesiology. Many go on to do something else. But let's take a look first at those direct prep jobs, the ones that they were supposedly directly prepared for. And I say supposedly because they're prepared for many other things as well. Pretty good employment, 80th percentile um, on both job postings and BLS current employment. However, you'll remember we had 22,000 folks um, who majored in this. So you've actually got a little bit fewer job postings per graduate than we have, you know, job postings than we have graduates. Um, and uh, PLS mean wages are not great at 54,000. That's the 34th percentile. So we're um, below average despite having gotten the degree. That's not what we would be hoping for. So uh, that's a, a bit discouraging for this particular program. Now, the good news is that many folks actually don't go into direct prep fields. That opens up a whole slew of additional jobs, some 220,000 in terms of current BLS employment, and it doubles the number of job postings available, um, adds another 24. Um, it also substantially increases the potential wages. Uh, now, why is that? Well, there are a couple of things going on. One, folks go on to get graduate degrees, uh, which they're not directly prepared for with an undergraduate. They're not prepared for jobs that require a graduate degree as an undergraduate but they can go on to get that graduate um, training. So many people who get a degree in kinesiology will actually go on to get a graduate degree and um, learn to do other things and to apply that in a way that's more lucrative. So um, that's part of why you see a much higher number um, in terms of wages. Although frankly, that number is still not great at the 26th percentile. 
Uh, I mentioned that people don't always do what they're told. Uh, they don't always go into the occupations for which they're directly prepared. In this case, uh, according to the National Center for Education Statistics, they're not prepared to do a whole lot. Um, they only are prepared to go into three occupations. As you can see on the right, that's kind of not true. Um, kinesiology majors, according to the American Community Survey, go on to do all sorts of things, some 483 different occupations. The top 10 are here. They become middle school teachers. They go on into management. In fact, we have someone who was trained as a personal trainer, went on and got a master's degree, who's now working for us and doing extraordinarily well. So uh, just because you studied one thing doesn't mean you can't go on and do something else. Here we see fitness trainers, not surprising. A little bit disappointing to see a lot of retail salespeople don't really need a college degree for that. So we are always hope to see very, very few in retail sales, um, not retail management, but retail sales. Uh, when we're looking at the fields people go into with a college degree. We've got some registered nurses, secondary school teachers. Some people go into sales. Some people go on and get their degree and, and become physical therapists, assistants or aides, coaches and scouts and customer service representatives. So is it, it is a degree that allows you to get into a lot of different fields um, because it gives you uh, some good generalist training and a college degree. Well, it gives you okay generalist training and a college degree depending a little bit on what gen eds that students are required to take before they go specifically into kinesiology. Um, competitive intensity, uh, very competitive program. Almost everybody has it, 546 colleges across the country. The ones that didn't have it added it, some 39 new programs added last year. Still pretty good size, 23 completions a year for the median school. Uh, that's going to be about 100, 120 students enrolled at any given time. So healthy enrollment. And importantly, the median program size is still going up, up 4%. Um, so why does that matter? I begin to think a, a market is saturated when the number of people enrolled in the median program starts to go down. That means the people are in the market are having trouble filling their seats. In this case, it's still going up. Um, so it's a, it continues to be an opportunity for growth despite the level of competition. Now, not an easy opportunity. Uh, we're at the 88th percentile in terms of Google cost per click. And this is a metric where a high percentage is not good, a percentile is not a good thing, means it's more competitive. Why does Google cost per click tell us that? Because people bid for those clicks. So the, the more expensive the click, the more players there are in that space competing for them. The competitive index is above average, uh, but it's not toxic. It's at the 64th percentile um, at 0.35. Google's uh, ratio is on a zero to one scale. So we're still below average in terms of uh, other thing, other keywords that uh, people compete for outside of this particular program. And finally, online, not a significant factor in the space yet. What kind of degree do you need? Well, bachelor's is the most common with 83% of graduates uh, with a bachelor's degree in kinesiology. In terms of where people go to work, um, it's split between bachelor's and master's degrees. So, um, and actually a pretty healthy proportion there, 13%, um, actually getting a doctoral degree, degree probably in physical therapy um, or related fields. So um, there's room to go on and get a graduate degree, but certainly a bachelor's is a good start. Who takes this? Um, and it might seem odd to look at the uh, demographics of an individual program, but as we've studied it, the demographics actually change a lot from program to program. I'll give you a very obvious example. Um, nursing tends to be 90% female still. Uh, no good reason for that. There's no reason men can't become nurses. And in fact, it's a, a very good job. And I think a lot more men probably should. Um, it would be a better career than what they may have chosen, but they don't. Um, now, please be careful. Uh, I'm not advocating that these numbers should be what they are. Um, you know, they, there's no reason for uh, a program to, to skew towards one demographic group or another. But there are cultural biases and probably some steering that goes on of their peers and possibly even advisors in terms of what programs people should take. I suspect most of that steering is unconscious, um, but nonetheless, these stereotypes persist. So in this case, um, it's 59% female, 41% male. Now that may seem skewed female, but that 59, 41 is about uh, the average across all of higher ed. So it's normative here. Um, it's 48% white. And actually, I think when you look at it, um, this program in particular 
is basically pulling about the average for the United States across most demographic groups. So if you will, it's very neutral. Um, and uh, in that sense, it's a very interesting if you haven't got it or you're recruiting because it will pull in a diverse group of students um, by its nature as a program. Um, so I think that's, uh, you normally don't see this. You'll normally see it skewed towards one group or another. So finding a program that's neutral is actually uh, positive, I think. And of course, we put that all together on a page for you. We call a program scorecard. Um, one of the things I'm working on is to be able to give you this, not just in numbers and colors. Um, we will have a text version of this so you can read um, the story uh, probably by the end of this year. Um, I think that'll be a general trend as we apply generative AI to the analysis of numbers. You'll be able to get plain English ways of interpreting things in addition to all these numbers. Uh, we do this because having it on one page is helpful. And when you get good at it, you can glance at the page and get a very good sense of what's going on and whether it's a program you would choose to pursue. Uh, in this example, you know, obviously student demand is great. Very quickly, you can see we've got a problem with employment. Not doesn't take long to look down and find those very low scores in the pink and figure out part of the problem is wages. And then we've got a problem over here in competition as we discussed. So, um, you know, again, it allows you when you get experience with the tool um, to do to understand what's going on very, very quickly. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Jerry. If uh, you could walk us through, Jerry's been a, a wonderful user of our systems um, and uh, been able to get some real advantage out of it and help his college turn around. So without further ado, Jerry. Very good, thank you very much, Bob. And uh, <clears throat> I'm really excited to share our story with you today. And, and it's amazing how uh, our sector has changed over the years and what we're able to do now compared with just, just a few years ago. Uh, so this is a picture of our uh, Leffler Chapel building across from our uh, Lake Placida. Uh, so we do have some religious roots. In 1899, our college was established by the Church of the Brethren. Uh, we're no longer religiously affiliated, uh, but we do have our, our motto, educate for service. That's, that's really ingrained in a lot of our program offerings that kind of reflect uh, those beginnings. Um, if you would like to come to campus, you would be allowed to actually fish in this lake. We do stock it with like trout and bass and, and that is open up to, to the community. Let's go to the next slide and take a look at some stats. So we're located in Southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, we roll about uh, 2000 students with a mix of undergrad and graduate programs. And we're, we're alike, uh, you know, a lot of the other institutions across the country as being very, very tuition uh, dependent. And we have a lot of majors. We have uh, 77 majors along with 94 minors and concentrations. So when you, when you put that many uh, variables together, uh, you really need a system uh, to help support you in making decisions because it's, otherwise it just gets, gets overwhelming. Uh, so th this is uh, kind of a look at uh, where, where we've been over the years. Uh, the chart on the left, it's, it's not quite a smiley chart yet. And I, I think it's going to be a smiley chart next year where it's going to end kind of where it started. Uh, so we had experienced our, our low point in enrollment in uh, 1920. That's actually the year I arrived and several other of my peers on the leadership team. And the college had been uh, pursuing all kinds of ways uh, to turn that around. You know, a, a focal point back then was just throwing all kinds of money in, into marketing. Um, and then some other, uh, maybe even gimmicks, I, I would say that, that just didn't work uh, to move the needle. So it was year after year after year of enrollment losses. And it was, it was really discouraging uh, for the institution. So as we evaluated uh, our situation during that, that fall of 2019, we, we definitely uh, determined that we needed some help here uh, to get a handle on this. Because like I said, with, with such a broad slate of program offerings, you really need to have uh, good data to inform the decisions uh, that you're making uh, in regards to that. So uh, we started on a process and there's four bullets here. I'll take you through each one of those in the, in the following slides. And, and those bullets and, and the related uh, activities, along with the other things that we've done, 
have, have really uh, turned things around. We're, we're looking very strong uh, for fall of 23. And, and I credit a lot of that to our ability to, to really understand uh, all aspects of our programs, not only on the academic side, you know, student learning outcomes and, and, and such, we were always good at that, but actually the economics and, and how, how, uh, how instructional costs and enrollment uh, in, impacts uh, the contribution rates of these programs. So let's, let's take a look at, at each of the things that, that we went through. So, so we engaged with Gray. This was in January of 2020. And I'm sure you guys remember 2020, right? That was a pretty crazy year. So this was January. And we, we uh, had a two-day workshop. And we had about 30 people participating. And 20 uh, were faculty members, uh, typically department chairs or other faculty members in leadership positions. So it was an extremely collaborative process. And day one was really fun. In fact, I think that even the lunch was better on day one. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but we talked about all kinds of new programs uh, that, that, that could pertain to us that we might be able uh, to start. And, and that because of our situation here, our location and things, it really worked out for us. So that, that was good. Uh, day two was a little tougher. Because day two, we took a look at what we were currently operating. And as part of that process, we, we identified some programs that weren't doing so well. Uh, and when I say they weren't doing so well, um, I'm mostly talking about enrollment at this point, uh, because we had not actually looked at, at economics uh, then. But, but based on that, that review and discussions with the faculty, we decided to take the next step and do the work that needed to be done to implement the program's economics, uh, program economics system. And, and that, so I, I would say that that's what wasn't easy to do. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people who are involved in this process. For us, it was institutional research, a lot of staff on the gray side who work with us, but they helped us through this. And, and actually we've done this every year since. So we have a nice, uh, historical base of financial information to track the progress of each of these programs. So, so we went into our economics workshop, and that was, uh, I believe that was in March of 2020. And I think something else happened in March 2020. I don't exactly remember what it was. It might have been our last face-to-face -face workshop. I think uh, although I, uh, we might have even done that one over the phone, as a matter of fact. You so, know what? I think we were in person uh, among ourselves, but but you guys uh, were online or something. Yeah. That's right. That sounds right. <laughs> but when we shut down travel, uh, shut down travel um, around like the fifth or sixth of March that year. That was unbelievable. But but we so we were in a in a difficult financial situation, so we were not going to stop. So we didn't think this was discretionary at all. Uh, but, but going into this uh, exercise, what we thought we were going to do is, okay, we're going to be able to identify all these programs that are losing money. We're going to take all the steps that we need. They're going to be hard, but we're going we're gonna to slash these programs, and then we're going to come out on the other end uh, much better off. And then when, when we actually saw the data, we were like, oh, we're not going to do that. <laughs> you know, it, Gary, I've seen this chart. A number of times, it is one of the more widespread myths. Um, actually, unfortunately, it's state government as well as uh, trustees that you're going to find all this money by cutting programs. And as you can see, um, the real data from Elizabethtown, there are only a handful of programs on this chart that are red that aren't contribution positive. So when you go to cut, you may do more harm than good. And the other thing that's really important, um, more than half the programs that are small um, are contribution positive. So if you cut based on size, you're going to actually make things worse. Um, you really, if you're going to make, if you want to cut programs, you absolutely have to look at the numbers. You may cut the wrong ones. Uh, why is that? Because the revenue from students is often greater than the cost of the instructors, and the students may not show up if you cut their program. So, and that's before you even get into the relatively bleak economics. Of, um, pro, of you know teaching out a program where you can have progressively smaller classes with the same teaching cost. So, 
this is not at all unusual. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, that's that's quite all right. So, um, so we have, <laughs> so there's a uh, the uh, the dots that are on this chart to the right and actually up, which which is where you want to be. Uh, there's seven of them, uh, seven, and they're all professional programs, and they account for about 60% of the net revenue, actually the contribution uh, that comes into the college every year. Uh, so all the other programs, like the 70 other programs, so it's like the seven making a, a, a really good contribution, and then a whole bunch uh, not doing quite as well. Um, so, so the faculty saw this and 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 when when we had this meeting uh, we we actually established groups of faculty members because there was pretty many I mentioned there were like 20 and uh, so they had a group of uh, I, I'd say liberal arts departments okay like English and, and things like that and and I was assigned to that group and and I know I don't think that was done by action because these these were the departments with the most uh, heavy fiscal challenges, and uh, so that that was not a fun day at all. <laughs> because it, it started out really well, but you, you go through some difficult conversations. Because as a faculty member, they've never seen this information before. Okay, and and they're like like revenues and expenses, contribution stuff. That's not in their vocabulary. So like getting them exposed to this, talking through some of these difficult conversations uh, was, was actually a really useful part of, of what we did. So, so what we decided to do, what we actually had to do was determine ways of essentially uh, increasing the contributions of the programs that are, that are lower on this chart and you do that by improving their curricular efficiency. Um, so you can do that in, in two main ways. You either increase enrollments in those programs, that, that will sure uh, help a lot, or you can reduce your instructional costs. So we decided uh, we wanted to pursue both. Um, and in ways of uh, reducing our instructional costs, uh, we implemented a, a distinguished professor program. Now we had, at the time, eh, maybe about 115 full-time faculty members. Um, and um, you know, many of them had been at the college for, for quite some time. They all had tenure, of course. Uh, we rolled out a uh, distinguished professor program. So as, as part of this program, we offered faculty the ability to, uh, to teach half-time, and we would compensate them half-time. They get to keep their office, they keep their email, they can visit the library, the fitness center, all that, all that other stuff. Uh, and then after that first year, uh, they can continue to teach uh, up to 18 credits uh, based on the college's needs at our highest adjunct rate, which is a lot less uh, than they were making, of course, as full-time faculty members. Um, the, uh, the, the term of the agreements was for three years. Um, and then that was actually renewable for another three years. And it was evaluated every year. So basically the faculty member had to behave. So there's there's like standards of conduct, things like that. They had to maintain their certifications if, if there was, was any. Um, and they many of them uh, took advantage of the program. Actually, as of, as of today, I think there's a total of 11. Now 11 might not sound a lot uh, to you, but we current our co current complement of full time faculty is about 105, so 11 compared to 105 is a big number. You know, it's over 10 percent. Uh, so this and and what's what's even better about this? These individuals were able to exit the college with dignity. You know, their names are on a plaque. They have their office. They can stay connected with their colleagues if they do a good job teaching. If they behave themselves, we'll probably continue to sign them up because. By and large, they're really good professors. So, so being able to, to, to keep their institutional knowledge, knowledge is great. Um, so so we, we did that, we, we made some other changes. And as a result, uh, we reduced our average student credit hour cost. Uh, this also includes the impact of the enrollment changes from $251 a student credit hour 
down to 219. So that, that's a reduction of 13% over three years. And, and consider over that three years, like costs have gone up. So, so like the real decrease was, was even, even more than that. So it, it was a really, really good, uh, really good exercise. Now, as I remember, there's a key part of that, which is uh, effectively reducing the teaching load um, by looking at this at the course level um, to identify courses that were low enrolled um, and begin to trim those back so that uh, your faculty would generally be teaching to fuller classrooms, um, which is a, you know, honestly, when you get down to it, the one of the major drivers of academic cost uh, per student credit hour is simply the number of students in a course. Does that ring a bell? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, th there were many things uh, that we did, and uh, we could spend all day talking about them. But but yes, we went down to the individual course level. We continue to do that um, because if, if you don't do that, uh, those those inefficiencies, even though they might be a little bit in regards to a course, you have so many courses that it adds up to a really big number. So yeah, you, you do have to look at that level of detail. Yeah, that's our understanding of where you find the savings um, rather than at the program level. And it's a little less contentious um, as well. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide. So, so this is a, uh, a resource that was put together uh, by one of my colleagues, uh, Susie Mapp. She's our associate provost here. And this takes um, the graze data from, from a number of screens, puts, puts them on uh, one, one screen here. And we provide this to our deans uh, when we're meeting with them uh, talking about our annual uh, program evaluation process. And, and, and we go through, and as you can see, there, there's a column here that says cost drivers. That's, that's when we're looking at individual courses that are impacting the economics of each one of these programs. So we, we go through all this stuff and we talk about it. And our, and our goal is, is to address like, like outliers. So, so of course, our, our immediate attention goes to those red marks. And uh, you know we, we go through each of those and try to identify, you know, help our deans uh, identify ways of improving uh, those programs, the, the courses and the program's financial performance. A lot of our deans, uh, we we have like like six deans. Now they're they're really busy, right? So they they do have access to the to the grades data. Uh, some of them are better than others at actually going in and looking at this. So we 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 actually. Uh, help them do that, and and I would I would say that uh, if your institution uh, wants to pursue this, that I think it's really important to have a strong partnership between finance and academics. We we do here. Uh, what's great with Susie, I always pick on her because she like she knows everything I don't know, and and pretty much vice versa. So together we're we're like an unbeatable team. It's amazing. I hate doing presentations without her, because if I get a question and I don't know the answer, she always knows the answer, it's amazing. So uh, so that that has gone really well. We actually have our, our next workshop uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward uh, to, to going through that uh, with them at that meeting. And uh, finally, I guess I, I would end here with uh, a look at our, the online space. So. So all that stuff we talked about on the traditional programs, well, not all of it, but a lot of it, you just throw it out the window because the online space is so different. So, so you don't want to do like annual program reviews in the online space because that's not frequent enough. You, you have to look at this information uh, on a continual basis. So like one of the things we looked at is we looked at the pricing of our business program. And uh, uh, Graves has been able to provide uh, information regarding uh, institutions that aren't physically present in our market, but actually offer programs in our market. And for, for me, it was kind of like going on vacation. So you go on vacation, you eat a lot more than you usually eat, you drink a lot more than you usually drink, and you know you're gaining weight. But, but until you step on that scale and see how high that number went up, you know, you really don't understand what really happened. And what, and we knew intellectually 
that there were these national providers in our regional market, but it was just kind of like a, a thought that was out there. But when you saw it like this, you saw like all the all the completions uh, that they've been doing, and so the first thing you feel, well, the first thing that 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 we felt was maybe we were offended, okay. And, and this might be a typical higher ed uh, response, especially for those of us who have been in the industry for a while. Like, how dare they do this? <laughs> um, and then, then the next thought, you, you start to rationalize this. Well, their, their programs aren't as high quality as ours. You know, what's going on? And I'm like, yeah, their programs are as high quality as ours. But if they need accreditations, typically they have those accreditations. So then, then you get over this, this sort of thing and you think, okay, well, um, like, like we can't compete on price with these institutions, but we're on the ground here and they're not. So we have a huge advantage over them. So those, those dots at the bottom of this chart, uh, mostly toward the right hand side, those are our traditional uh, regional competitors, I would say. And that, that arrow is pointing uh, to our program there. So, so what we did, we adjusted our price uh, based on uh, comparison with our competitors. Um, and, and we're also doing different things uh, than the past. So since we're on the ground, we can go visit a corporation. We can walk in their door and we can talk to them. Hey, you know, we can, we can structure custom built programs or packages of programs for your needs. We're going to come to you uh, every single month. We'll review the progress uh, will help you generate enrollments uh, with your employees, will help provide incentives in that regard. So, so there are ways uh, you can definitely compete. I mean, a lot of this, uh, higher ed has gotten, the administration has gotten so hard over the years compared to the way it used to be, but there's always new ideas that you can implement to be successful. And, and you know, I, I think our numbers show that we've implemented those strategies and, um, and, and I'd encourage everyone on, on the uh, webinar to do that as well. So that's, that's a pretty quick wrap up. That's what we've been through. I'm, I'm a huge supporter of, of the grades information. I don't know what we would do without it. Um, so uh, I guess I'll turn it back to you, Miles. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, I, I just think it's wonderful to see a client that's been able to, have, to be this successful, really reverse the trend. Uh, it's very, very hard to do. And I talk to people all over the country who, are, who, you know, really have a little bit of the sky is falling and don't feel as if they can do anything about it. I think it's very helpful to remember that you can. Uh, and it requires both the cutting that you did as well as the investment and growth. One without the other doesn't really work. Um, so for those of us who, who I'm very growth focused, um, but I think there are others who are overly cost focused. And I don't think you can cut your way out of a decline in higher ed. I think you're more likely to start a tailspin and, and just be cutting indefinitely until there's really nothing left and there's no enrollment because the word gets out. So you're, you really have to do both. And it's very encouraging to see that that's not only possible, um, but been done and, and to a very significant degree to be back where you were this fall uh, with where you were back in the mid-teens is really great to see. Now we do have a couple of requests for looking at programs. I think we're more or less out of time. So if you'd like to stay, please do. Um, but for those of you who need to drop, we certainly understand. Um, and we've got a couple teed up. The first one is data science, I think. Uh, Wenel, do you wanna give it a shot? Yes, one second here. Stop sharing my screen. And we're gonna go into our system. Wenel's our head of customer success. So he's the person at Gray you really wanna talk to. Um, and he knows these systems better than I do. Uh, and always glad to discuss, you know, whatever may be going on in your particular system. And if you're looking at a program and want a second set of eyes, um, he and his colleagues would be glad to help you out. Great. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And then when I type in data, I think we're gonna get a couple options, um, analytics and science, but I'll go with science. Actually, they might be combined here. We'll see it in a second. You may want to turn your video off, but now. Yeah, it's been raining all day down here. So there we are. 
So data science, data analytics combined here, before I even open up the details, the things that we're gonna expect to see, we're gonna see strong numbers in student demand and strong numbers in employment, but we're gonna have some questions around the competitive intensity. It seems to be a competitive program. We'll click on scorecard and we'll get the details running here. While this is loading, the color coding is gonna come back, right? Again, student demand is green, that dark green 98th percentile. Um, saying that the student demand metrics for this program are performing stronger than a lot of the other programs that we have available in the market. Why is that the case? Well, we're going to categorize the data in two ways here, size and growth for student demand. And both here are very strong. I'm seeing lots of dark greens, greens, and a couple of light blues all um, speaking to the strength here, specifically Google search volumes and international page views. Um, seem to be the strongest two metrics here in student demand. Yeah, it's interesting to remember they're the more forward looking kinds of things. Enrollments at the 93rd percentile, too. Uh, in effect, what's happening now is completions are trying to catch up. Um, so the, you know, the completions are people enrolled four or five years ago. So the forward looking um, view is really very, very positive. And look at the growth. One else. Unbel I don't remember ever yes. seeing 90% growth in a program of this size before. Um, yep. and then, I know the question was specific to uh, trends and whatnot. I mean, we also have the ability, we're not going to do that now, but we can tell you what are the keywords that we're tracking and, and how are those keywords tracking over time as well across states. Um, so I'd be curious to see what are the specific keywords associated with data science and data analytics that are trending up and accounting for this big Google search volume increase as well. Um, over on the employment side, um, we're seeing some strength in job posting totals here, 83rd percentile, 28,000 job postings. But what really catches my eye here is uh, the ACS wages wow. between 30 and 60. 128,000 here at 89th percentile, which is very different than, you know, just looking at the direct prep um, opportunities, which is what we see here for BLS mean wages. Um, this will give us a more true sense of where these graduates at the bachelor's level end up taking this degree. Um, it looks like 40% of the graduates here are uh, assuming a graduate degree as well. Yeah, they're going on to get a grad degree. That's right. Mostly masters, not surprised. So strong student demand for uh, data science, data analytics, strong employment, right? But before we go ahead and dive into this market and go ahead and offer this program, we're going to see some pinks here and just some concerns in the current competitive nature uh, of the market. We're going to see campuses with graduates, right? 226 campuses. This is an 89th percentile. Um, and the way our scoring system is going to work is it's going to actually attribute negative points here because this will be interpreted as very competitive, right? Um, and there's some nature of subjectivity to competition, right? Um, for some institutions, very competitive might be an exciting thing. And for others, it might be a very scary thing. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and level that off or balance that off with an understanding of the average and median program sizes, where sure, this might be very competitive, but it seems like average program completions are still pretty strong at the 82nd percentile, but median program completions are right around average at nine here. And it's growing at a good clip. That's one of the highest growth rates and median completions at 96 percentile. In-market right. saturation, not so great. Yeah. It's, we're not the first people to think of this idea. And uh, you were at 90, 81st percentile in cost per click. 99th percentile in com competition. So uh, there's going to be a lot of competition in the online advertising space, for, even for an on-ground program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then finally, all the way to the right, we're just going to break down the award level on how this program tends to complete nationally. And we're going to see 37% of all completions here at the bachelor's level, and then 50% at the master's level, right? So this will give you some insight into you know, if we're going to enter this market, at what award level should we consider entering? And if we already exist in this market, is there an opportunity for us to expand into a different award level? Um, and we don't usually do this here, but just because the question was around trends, I'm just going to quick uh, click on the competitors tab quickly because um, 
here we can really see kind of that linear growth trend from 2016 all the way up to 2021 in terms of overall completions here. Okay. Any other programs out there? There were a couple. Um, let me just check on our audience, though. I think we really ought to wrap up. For it. We're we're well over time. So, um, if anybody would like to stay or do a, a, a Elvis and Philip, um, what we'll do is we'll pull the profiles for those two and give you the scorecard for each of those programs at the national level. Um, so you will get them. We'll do that uh, over this afternoon, so you can have a look at them. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to Wanell. He's more available than I am usually, um, or I'm happy to take a call as well if you'd like to do that. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. And a special thanks to uh, Jerry Silverman. Really appreciate your, your being on here with us and sharing how you turned around the situation at, at E-Town. Uh, great story. Well, thanks.